I wonder if you remember a TV show called Dirty Job. Yes. yes. Mike Rowe, who uh, for some reason decided it would be a good idea to find all the most disgusting and terrible things people have to do for a work to help other people have what they need, go out and do those jobs with them and, and learn what their lives were like. And obviously, the part of the entertainment was just the, the grossness of the things he had to do. I think when he first proposed the job, the channel that he proposed it to said they didn't have any room in their schedule for a talk show that took place in a cesspit. That was an idea of what the job was like, but that wasn't really the point. The point really was the talking, wasn't it? Yeah, it was gross, but he was learning from the people and they formed this connection. These wonderful people he met who were doing these, these terrible, dirty jobs. And I should have warned you, this is not a normal sermon. There will be audience participation in the sermon. <laughs> I'm going to tell you about a dirty job I did, and I'm going to ask you if you have any examples from your own life of things you've done that were like that. When I was 15, I spent the summer in Somalia, and because embassy kids tend to go out and get bored in the summer, they found jobs for us. And my job was to go out with a work crew to clean up houses. Uh, the, the embassy owned all the houses that the embassy workers lived in because there were not many places that were good to live in. So they would send people out to clean them between occupants and also to clean out the new houses when they were built before the first people went to live in them. And the job I remember in particular was I went out to a house where they had put down the tile on the floor. It had a raised pattern in it. And I guess they didn't have the normal stuff you would use to lay, to lay tile on the floor, so they used cement. And there was cement under and between the tile. There was also cement on top in all the little bits of the design. And so I spent days with a hammer and a screwdriver chiseling out the cement that was in the designs of the tiles. It was a thankless job because it, it, it was so small. It produced so little for each amount of effort that I put into it, and yet it was my job for that time, and I did it. And there were other people working alongside me, Somali women working alongside me, who, uh, this wasn't just their summer job, it was they did all the, they did all the time in their entire lives. So I was able to form a connection with them, to know who they were, to talk to them as we sat there doing this job that seemed so futile and so meaningless, uh, and yet something really important godly came out of it in the people I got to know. Many of you have a story of a dirty job. There are an awful lot of moms sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of I'm dirty. guessing there are one or two dirty jobs, or any you feel you can repeat in public. Uh, when my son transferred from Coastal Carolina University to James Madison, we had to go and move him out of his apartment in South Carolina. He and two other soccer player boys had been living in this apartment all year. Fairly certain that the bathrooms in the apartment had not seen any kind of a scrub brush in the entire nine months they lived there. The other mom was a nurse. She's like, I'm pretty sure SARS is growing in here. It's, it's pretty disgusting. And it took me an hour and a half with the aid of a toothbrush to get all the gas out of the ground in the bathroom. My mother would tell the same story about my college apartment. I had no doubt. <laughs> I'm not cleaning my daughter's college apartment. <laughs> Just for the record. Well, it's not to say they didn't help. We, you know, we set them on the stain that was in front of the television set. I don't even want to know what that's about. <laughs> well, one time my daughter was living with a friend who kind of went off the deep end. There were fleas in the apartment, I, and the, uh, the roommate had written on the walls. And it, was, it was a long day of just picking up, throwing things in the dumpster because there were fleas on there. When I, uh, when I was a boy, we had a great We weighed 125 pounds. Southeast Ohio. We had pretty hard winters during that time. So we would let him out. He would go into the side yard and come back immediately. And 
when the snow thawed, my father gave my brother and I a pair of shovels and <laughs> told us to clean up out there. And it looked like a minefield. I was <laughs> so we had to go out and, and clean that up. And uh, we found all our G.I. Joe toys, <laughs> pieces of carrot, lumps of tin foil, the strap in my binoculars case that was in bite sized pieces, <laughs> and uh, threw it in the ravine next to the house. <laughs> when we first moved out here, um, I was in the kitchen and there was a bee on the wall. So I climbed up on the counter and I took my flip flop off and I tacked it and thousands of bees came out of the wall. <laughs> and well, I ended up using hairspray. <laughs> so I had to clean up the whole thing with the hairspray and then I had to cut this giant nest out of the wall. Um, you have better stories than I do, all of you. This is kind of where Easter started, isn't it? The faithful women who went to the tomb to do a dirty job. You notice that there are no Peter and James and John. There are no Roman authorities. There's no Pontius Pilate in this story. There are no temple authorities. Uh, to be honest, there are no men at all in this story. And that should tell you something about who normally does the dirty work. The women who were the faithful followers of Jesus, who had sacrificed more than most of his other followers, given who they were and what they were doing at that time, were the ones who went to the tomb to do this job. And that is when Easter happens. It's not churchy. It's not nice and polite. There are no white gloves. There are no chocolate eggs. It, it's not like they're sitting politely in rows, listening and waiting for something to happen. It happens in the middle of going and doing something they had to do. And that is often where God comes to us, not in uh, the moments of perfection, not in the moments we expect, but in the moments when it seems like everything is lost, when we're worried, when we're confused, when nothing seems to be going right. That is when Easter first happens so often in our own lives. I have a story about that too, and then it's time for audience participation again. <laughs> when my parents moved up to their retirement community in Pennsylvania, I started going every other weekend, sometimes every weekend, to check on them. There's a point in your life when suddenly you start to take a greater interest in how your parents are after they serve that, that long period where they take care of you, and that period where you kind of ignore each other, suddenly it all gets turned around and I went and saw my parents an awful lot. Then COVID happened. And I went months and months just talking to them on the phone and never actually seeing them. And then finally I said, okay, enough of this. After a few months of COVID and feeling like we were trapped, we decided we'd have a picnic one day. The one Sunday when the bishop gave everybody the day off because he was going to do church for all of us. I packed up my picnic and I went up to Pennsylvania and we greeted each other from a long distance across a parking lot. And then we drove separately in our cars off to some place where there was a picnic table and we sat down again at a safe distance and had our picnic. And it was like the world had begun again. There was a, we were right next to a baseball field. There were kids who were gonna do their little league game that day. There was traffic, there was the, the beauty of the summer. It was if Easter had come for us that day, we would be resurrected. After not seeing each other for months and months, we were able to sit down and have a meal together. And although it was very simple, and we went away again and didn't see each other for a long time after, it was like a little Easter for us. We reunited in that little time to remember what it was like to be together. I wonder if you have a resurrection story as well quite as easy as the dirty job stories, I know. <laughs> Has there been a time when something happened that sort of woke you up, reminded you of the grace of God that seemed to have been lost? When uh, 
uh, when we moved back to the East Coast from Oklahoma in 1984, and my children were very small, two and three, and not really verbal a lot. Um, <laughs> but we, um, Stan had a job in Virginia and we hadn't been able to sell our house so we couldn't live in Virginia together. I lived here in Newark with my parents, God bless them both, and um, he came up on weekends. And for me, Fridays were like that. It was like the sun rose again on Friday afternoon when he pulled into his parents' driveway. And we all had dinner together and had a chance to be, you know, just be dad, which he missed desperately during the week. Um, and, and we had a chance to be a family every Friday for six months. And it was really a wonderful gift to be able to do that. Anyone else? It doesn't come to mind right this minute. I hope it does sometime today. There's something that comes up in your memory when God was reawakened or reawakened you. Because that is the message of today. We talked about something that happened 2,000 years ago, but it happens constantly in our lives if only we will notice it. God continues to come to us. The, the Easter continues to happen all the time. We continue undoubtedly to God's amazement to be surprised that God continues to do this. We continue to run away in fear sometimes when we see it happen. And yet God persists. Easter continues to happen. Thanks be to God, God doesn't stop doing it just because we don't notice. Just because we're not ready for it or because it wasn't what we were expecting. Thanks be to God that Easter continues to come so today, all that we need to do is be amazed. Amen. Amen. Amen.